So Tom ha is someone who has been very close to the Oracle Institute almost from the beginning. Um, he lives in Charlottesville and we met um, years ago. I think it was at um, the bookshop in town. And ever since then, uh, Tom and I have been close friends. He is a retired professor of mathematics and also computer research. And so he brings to this discussion of 9-11 uh, a scientific background. Um, he also is exceedingly artistic. And I'm not sure if we're going to hear one of his songs tonight, but we, we can. Um, and he did a whole CD uh, of music that he composed himself dedicated to the memories of those who were lost on 9-11 and also um, lyrics which, you know, mimic the questions that we're going to be exploring tonight because there certainly are many questions surrounding what happened on that fateful day. So let us start. I'm going to turn it over to Tom and we're going to delve into the 9-11 mystery, which quite frankly for many, um, many of those in the building industry, architects, engineers, it's not all that mysterious. So take it away, Tom. All right. Thanks, Laura. And uh, I have over the years given quite a few talks uh, back when we could do them in person and uh, throughout the, the East Coast a little bit. And, uh, you know, it's a complicated subject, but we'll, I'll introduce some of the some of the main elements, certainly not all the main elements. And, you know, we'll, I understand I have about 20 minutes, right? So uh, you let me know when, when I'm going too long. Okay, so we'll do a little screen share here. And we're gonna start, Laura suggested that we start with a video of building seven collapsing. So I'm going to click this and supposedly, and then I'll make it larger. Supposedly you're going to be able to see this video. Yeah. Or that obvious, you can see the oh, yeah. implosions. Okay. So I'm going to say a little bit about that, and then I'm going to start a PowerPoint after after a bit. But so it looks like a classic demolition. And you may remember those of you who were around at that time that some of the newscasters would say that as it was coming down. This looks like a, a demolition, you know. Well, it certainly does. And this recent, there have been a number of studies. Uh, and the most recent one we were talking about, that's one from, that came out in March uh, from the University of Alaska in Fairbanks and uh, from their engineering department and Dr. Leroy Holsey was the, the main uh, engineer professor uh, involved with the study. And after four years, they came to, they, they do a lot of computer modeling of it. And they came to the conclusion that uh, the columns uh, all, within 1.3 seconds, all the columns gave way, which the official story is it was a progressive collapse from the top down. And that certainly would not have happened uh, as quickly. And there have been a little, you know, several studies before this that have concluded that it was a controlled demolition. But the official study is was done by the uh, by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and that study concluded that it was not a controlled demolition; that it was caused by fires, and then three columns gave way. And the whole building came down. Well, a lot of people didn't believe that, but uh, that was the official story. The, the first official story from the 9-11 Commission, 2004 and 5, was nothing. It, they didn't mention Building 7. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of disgruntled people about that because uh, it's a 47-story building that collapsed. So then NIST did their study. Okay, so now there's this last one. 
And if you do want to find out more about that, the architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth have a program from 3 till 6 tomorrow. And uh, Dr. Holsey will be one of the presenters. And there's a brand new film just out called Seven, a documentary uh, made about the study that he and his colleagues did. Uh, so trying to explain this very complicated study. So Building Seven was one type of collapse. And the point to be made is that for this was at 520 in the afternoon. The Towers 1 and Towers 2 fell down in the morning. And in the afternoon, there, was, there were fires in Building 7, but not extensive fires on a couple floors. And part of one corner was hit by debris from the North Tower, but everyone agrees that that was not sufficient to cause, cause the building to collapse like that. And if it's a controlled demolition, that takes weeks to prepare. So it wasn't prepared during the afternoon. So it had to have been planned beforehand. Um, well, that's enough for Building 7 right now. And, but I want to show you one of the towers collapsing. So that, uh, that affected a lot of us. But you see how it's a different sort of collapse? Not like Building 7, but it's another way a controlled demolition can be done. It can be done from the top down. And uh, the official story of that collapse is that there were fires and then the, the, the plane hit also. And, uh, but the fires caused the top floors to come down and then pancaked all the way down. But one of the problems with that is that the, it came down faster than it should have given the physics of the floors below. So that's been a, a, a discussion going on for quite a while. And uh, we're gonna get into that as much as we can here. Now let me open up the uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so here's a, a still, of course. And some people look at that. I mean, I have friends who, as soon as it happened, they said, that's an explosion. That's not just this top part up here. Can you see my arrow up right at the top? Yeah, that's the tower from the top of the building. Okay, so it was coming down. The top of the building was coming down. So some people see that and they say, well, that makes sense. I think I looked at it that way at first, that the top you know, 12 floors were falling down and causing the other floors to collapse. And uh, it looks like an explosion, but, um, you know, we're not sure. So, but all these uh, architects and engineers for AE, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, uh, there are 3,500 of them that have signed a petition after studying this for many years, calling for a new investigation because they say that this was a building exploding and there's science behind what they're saying. And this does look like a building exploding, columns going up and out up to 500 feet. With, uh, so it is a different kind of demolition and that would have taken a long time. Um, to, to set up, and obviously these 19 terrorists, Al-Qaeda terrorists, were not the people who could do that. <laughs> they, they couldn't have access for weeks into the towers. So uh, that's what it looked like. So the towers, this is one of the towers being built back in 19, they're finished in 1970. The 9-11 Commission report said that most of the weight of the building was held up by the outside. Uh, now you can see these outside panels, steel panels going up, beams. Mm -hmm. Most of the weight of the building 
and was supported by that. And that the interior, which I'm pointing to now, was a hollow steel shaft in which elevators and stairwells were grouped. That's a quote. So they said, really, that the inside was not doing any of the support, which is absolutely incorrect. Here's the inside during construction. You can see the size of these girders on the left. And then you can see in the background, one of the panels from the, the outer sides. So it didn't make sense to a lot of engineers that that whole center column of 47 of these huge columns would just collapse. They would have been standing like a, a tree trunk if all the branches fell off. So that didn't make sense. And another thing that didn't make sense was, here's a photo before, obviously before, you see the, uh, the yellow uh, uh, molten iron coming out in the lower right. Uh, jet fuel yeah. and off equipment get up to about 700 degrees. It takes 2,700 degrees to have molten iron coming out. So that didn't make any sense when people brought that up. So what was causing the steel to melt and run out before the buildings collapse? Some people said it's aluminum. Well, that molten aluminum, that doesn't look anything like the other. All right, so it's not aluminum. And this is, we don't know if this was right after a building fell, but if you look at these columns, you can see that they are uh, cut. You see the one in the center there? Mm -hmm. It's cut at an angle. That's what you do when you want to bring a building down. You cut at an angle so that as soon, it is, soon as it is cut with a charge of some sort, then it comes down. It doesn't tip over, it comes straight down. And uh, then the one on the right uh, looks as though it it, it was cut off, uh, at, you know, on the flat. But the point is, uh, if you look at all of the, uh, uh, the slag, the, the silver stuff around the top of that, the one, the one that's on the slant there, what that is, that's left over when thermite, thermite is used to cut through steel. In a few seconds, it would cut through that. That's what is used for a controlled demolition. And you see the firemen down at the bottom. Now, at, when that photo first came out, uh, people, some people were saying, well, that's right after it happened, obviously. And that's proof that it was a controlled demolition. Well, the response to that by other folks was, no, this was a few days later when it had been cut purposely to start to clear things out. Well, we don't know. That. We don't know which, but I wanted to show you what, how thermite, that's the name of the, uh, you know, the material that, that cuts through, the chemical. Um, and uh, that, so that's how they do it in any controlled demolition. So that looks a little suspicious. Now, I'm going to do just a little bit on a study, a 27-page study that was finished in 2009. And it was called Active Thermitic Material Discovered in the Dust from the World Trade Center Catastrophe. The two main authors were Niels Herrett, and he at the time was a, a chemistry professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and Stephen Jones, the third one listed here, he at the time, earlier, he was one of the first people to speak up about 9-11. He was a professor of physics at Brigham Young University, but as he spoke up more and more, they retired him. And the University of Copenhagen, after Niels Herrett spoke up more, they retired him. Two very distinguished professors. And then the rest of the people are at, at different research uh, scientific groups. And together they did a study of dust that was collected from the towers. So I'm going to put their final conclusion up first. Based on these observations, which we'll talk about, we conclude that the red layer of the red-gray chips we have discovered in the World Trade Center dust is active, unreacted, thermitic material incorporating nanotechnology 
and is a highly energetic pyrotechnic or explosive material. That's a lot of words, and we're going to go through that a little bit. Uh, so the dust samples, uh, uh, Stephen Jones uh, put out a, a notice, that, does anybody have dust from anybody in New York City have dust that they collected? And this man, first man, Frank Delisio, he contacted, contacted him, and he, had, uh, he and another guy had uh, collected this dust 10 minutes after the first tower fell. So that's before Building 7 fell. So it wasn't dust from Building 7, it was dust from a, the tower, uh, the North Tower. And then Stephen White collected it the next day, and, and Jody Intermont uh, the next day, uh, or three days later. And then a week later, Jeanette McKinley, uh, she had gone back to her apartment and it was full of dust, and she's a, a, an artist, a sculptor artist, so she decided to keep some of that dust and see if she could make something out of it. Well, she ended up giving it to uh, Stephen Jones. And in that dust, so, so there are four samples. That's why the, it's in four parts here. In that dust, they found these little chips, very small chips. Uh, they're nano size, which means they're one billionth. This, this one on the, uh, the, the right corner here, 100 billionth nano. That's what billionth means, nanometers. So, so they're very small and uh, extremely small, and they were very much alike from the four different samples. They had a red area and they had a gray area. If you look down in that lower right corner, there's one on the side. You can see a red layer and a gray area. Well, some people say, well, that's probably paint. Well, they found out that it wasn't paint. So the four chips from the four different samples of dust look alike. Here's one of them blown up, you know, many times. 2,400 times to show the red on the top, even though it's not red in our picture, and then the gray area down below. So they're wondering, okay, what is this stuff? And it turns out that it has uh, aluminum plate in it, and the little nugget things are iron oxide, and um, aluminum and iron oxide together make uh, thermite, uh, which can be used to cut through that column that you saw before. But if it's nanothermite, it becomes an explosive, a very powerful explosive. So nano means that you have very, very small pieces of aluminum and iron oxide. It's like if you had, if you light an edge of a newspaper that's all together, it doesn't burn very fast. But if you tore it up into little bitty pieces and put those pieces in a pile, and lit that pile, it would burn much faster. It's the same principle. So thermite is used to cut through steel and very quickly can cut through a, an engine block. Nanothermite, it was uh, developed within the last, uh, well, 10 years before 2001, and all that can be proven. And that is a very, very powerful explosive. Okay, so they looked at the four chips. That's why we've got four parts and each chip look in the upper left, has carbon, oxygen, iron, aluminum, and silicon, with iron as a separate item too. That's nano, that's thermite, nanothermite. Those are the components. And the next chip, same. A little bit different amounts, but all four. So they're getting suspicious. This looks like they all, all four of them have uh, the same thing, the red area. And then the gray area, of that chip. Those are all four alike. Uh, carbon, oxygen, iron, the oxygen. So this uh, chip has its own oxygen source. It'll, it, thermite will even burn underwater. It's got its own oxygen. And so those are all four alike. So they're getting more evidence that this is nanothermite. Uh, they then dissolved as much as they could in a uh, solvent that would, if in methyl, Methyl ethyl ketone, which would have dissolved paint totally, it didn't dissolve this, but it allows them to look at the uh, spectrum of the different elements. So you got iron and aluminum, oxygen, silicon, carbon. So again, they they show they proved to themselves that the chips had that in them. And here's where it gets even more interesting. The upper slide shows the the remnants, little uh, spherical iron balls, very small, very small, that are 
the uh, a byproduct, you know, sort of the waste after uh, nanothermite is exploded or, or thermite is, is exploded, is, is burned, you get these little spherical balls. And there's their component on the right. So this is, top one is a picture from a commercial company of, of these little, little balls, little spheres. And then what they did, the researchers, they looked at the spheres from the dust. That would be the middle one. They look just the same. And it turns out they have the same you know, relative uh, components within them. So that's another element to prove that what they are. So the bottom one, they took one of the chips and ignited it, a very small part of it. And uh, they did this more than one time. And they got these little spheres as you know the residue. And lo and behold, they have the same components as the other two. So that's further pretty compelling evidence that these red chips are nanothermite that had not exploded. The nanothermite that did explode brought the towers down. Okay, uh, another bit of it is that the four chips uh, would, would explode at about the same temperature, 420 degrees Celsius, and as the uh, paper says, in a very narrow exotherm, that means it didn't just heat up and burn through something, it exploded, very powerful explosion. So they did that. Then they compared it, the, the blue line is the, the chips that they have from the dust, and the red line is uh, commercial nanothermite. So this, the, the nanothermite that was used in the towers was even more powerful than commercial well, actually, I should say uh, nanothermite cannot be bought commercially. It's in Los Alamos and Livermore, the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, in one of my songs, I say, uh, how did bin Laden get the explosive? He, it, there's no mail order for nanothermite. Uh, so he, this that they used was even more powerful than what was known to exist at that time. So back to the final conclusion. Based they had many more observations than I just showed, but based on these observations, we conclude that the red layer of the red-gray chips we have discovered in the World Trade Center dust is active, unreacted thermitic material incorporating nanotechnology and is a highly energetic pyrotechnic or explosive material. Another thing they show in their paper is that uh, there, this was known, there were conferences uh, mostly Department of Defense related and uh, that talked about nanothermite being developed as a very highly energetic pyrotechnic. And they also talked about the nanothermite matches. Okay, they developed matches that are, uh, that have nanothermite in them and they can be placed on a girder after you paint the girder with the red liquid, they can do it as a gel or as a liquid. They can spray it on one of those beams, this red layer with the gray under it. Maybe the gray goes on first, then you spray on. And it's perfectly safe in this liquid form. When it dries, it, it is not subject to suddenly exploding when somebody bumps into it. It takes this little match, it, which is like a little circuit, I suppose, a little chip. They, they would place that on somewhere on the surface or somewhere near, and that can be remotely controlled. So on 9-11, they could, oh, how did they get it all in there, in that elevator shaft? That's where they did it. There was an elevator repair project going on for six months before 9-11. So every evening, there were people in the building inside that elevator shaft area where all those beams were, uh, repairing the elevator. So certainly it could have been sprayed on, painted on, and all the elect the uh, nanothermite matches placed at that time. And then when you're ready to bring the building down, you just are nearby somewhere and you you have the right, uh, you don't just tell Siri, take it down, you, you know, you have the right equipment to set up the sequence. Uh, one theory is that that equipment and everything was in building seven. Um, 
the, the regional FBI and CIA headquarters, or F FBI, we know for sure, were there. Um, and if that was the case, and you use that something in that building to, to bring the other two buildings down, then you would want to bring that building down too. So that's one possible reason that Building 7 was brought down after the towers were brought down.